Hello, my name is John Mount. I'm a data scientist who works as a consultant and trainer at a company called WinVector LLC. And in this short video lecture, I'd like to explain one of the most important data structures in data science, the vector. Now, obviously, vector is a mathematical term, not a computer science term. And mathematicians tend to define things in terms of their properties. They consider implementation an irrelevant detail that may change, or two things with different implementations may fundamentally be the same thing when we consider them from the point of view of properties. Now, we're not going to use this graduate level definition in our day-to-day -day work. I don't. I really don't expect anyone else to do. But what it's saying is the primary property of vectors from a mathematician's point of view is additivity. That they expect to be able to add them. Now, Mathematics can go up and down the scale. Here's a definition we really don't want to use from Bourbaki, that a vector is an instance of a k-module. Now what this is, is a standard mistake in teaching, which I try to avoid, that we're going to define something that's going to turn out to be very useful, vector, in terms of something a little more obscure that is basically more fundamental from a mathematical nature, but unlikely to be known to the audience. So basically, something I hope you'll have intuition about vector gets defined in terms of something you may not have intuition about module, which is a total mistake in teaching. So what we'll do instead is imitate some really good teaching by Gilbert Strang. We're going to teach vectors concretely. Now, Gilbert Strang has been the preeminent lecturer and professor in teaching linear algebra for years. This is an older book of his I adore, but I know he has newer books and newer videos that are just fantastic. Now, in his teaching, notice he starts with a concrete example, the vector 1, minus 2, 7. And that's what vectors are. They're just ordered lists of numbers. Now, this vector he called three-dimensional. And the idea is a vector represents a displacement, that it says it is one unit from the origin in one direction, two units from the origin in another direction, and seven units from the origin in a third direction. And we'll get to a concrete example where we show what we mean by this. But uh, also, basically the vector is drawn as an arrow from the origin, which also could be thought of as zero, position zero, 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 to where its head is. So that basically the vector is only described as the displacement from the origin to its head in some abstract geometric space. Now, you and I can possibly visualize one, two, and three dimensions, but vectors could have any number of coordinates, and they would then have abstract dimensions. Again, this is something we'll get concrete about and show that how this isn't a problem. So let's take a completely implementation operational view of vectors. To a computer scientist, a vector is just a mapping from an interval of integers to some floating point values. This is an overly specialized um, definition, and it puts the vector very near the data structures that often implement it, which would be the list or array data structures. Now in Python, this vector 4, 4, 2.5, it would map the integer 0 to the 4, because Python starts indexing at 0. It would map the integer 1 to the next 4. It would map the integer 2 to the 2.5. And uh, we see in the Python example as going at that third entry using the number 2. Now, Again, we're using the square bracket notation to build the vector in Python, and then another instance of the square bracket notation to dereference or access the cell, or the coordinate, or the value, which and we call these values that are just numbers, scalars. Now in R, the vector is built up by the C command instead of the square bracket notation. And again, in R, we start indexing from 1, not 0. So the third entry is labeled 3, not 2. So again, in both cases, we see how the code constructs a vector and how we get access to that cell. In data science, we largely use vectors for their ability to hold numbers, which is kind of mundane. Though we care about vectors because they're an incredibly useful data structure, um, they're a component of many other data structures, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. To get back to the vector's mathematical properties, which we do use in data science, and we'll demonstrate this in a concrete worksheet later in this lecture, we expect, just like mathematicians expect, the vectors to be additive. And again, we can take the vector 1, 2, 3 and add it to the vector 1, minus 1, 0. And by, definition, by definition, this is implemented as corresponding cells add up, i.e. the first cells of each vector are added to each other, creating a new first cell of the result vector. The second cells of each vector are added to each other, creating a new second cell of the result vector, i.e. the 2 and the minus 1 become a 1. And then the third cells are like the 3 plus 0 becomes a 3. This is what 
is meant in computer science by vectorized code that we issued the command to two vectors, not writing a for loop over every cell, and we expect all these operations to be performed for us. It could be sequentially, or it could be with a accelerated vector processor, such as is in our CPUs, or it could even be parallel, which may be in our GPUs. So the fact that we kept our hands off and just said, do all of this, and didn't over-specify with a for loop how to do it, is the grace of vectorized notation. We also expect some convenience notations. We expect multiplying by a scalar, as we show in the 10 times column, to perform the same multiplication to every cell, and we expect adding or subtracting a scalar to again do the same operation to every cell. A very common operation done in vectors is called the dot product, and it's written as two vectors with a dot in between them. And we're showing this with the vector 1, 2, 3, and the vector 4, 4, 2.5. And the definition is we multiply all pairs of like cells. So we do 1 times 4 for the zero first position, 2 times 4 for the second position, and 3 times 2.5 for the third position. And then we just add up all those terms. So corresponding cells are multiplied, and then the whole thing's added up, as we show here. In Python, the notation is done by the dot function. And in R, it's done by this inline percent star percent operator. We can also dot a vector against itself. This operation is called the Euclidean 2 norm squared, i.e. the square root of the dot product of a vector against itself is called the Euclidean 2 norm, and it's a measure of the size or magnitude of a vector, and it's a very standard geometric measure. Another operation we can take with vectors is the mean, and it has a very simple definition. It's just add up all the cells and divide by how many cells there are. And just to relate this back to earlier ideas, that is equivalent to dotting our vector against a vector of all ones and dividing by the count of the cells. For pairs of vectors, there's a natural distance measure. There's a number of distance measures, but the one we'll use is the sum of square differences. And it's defined as we sum over all cells, the difference in cells between the corresponding cells and the vectors, and square it. But it turns out that is just the difference in the vectors dotted against itself. This is the Euclidean distance, or it's the Euclidean norm of the um, distances. Again, a difference. Again, squared. Again, the interpretation is zero means identical. Large values mean we're experiencing large differences. In contrast, to a distance measure or metric, we also have something called a similarity measure. A similarity measure, in this case the Pearson correlation coefficient, it, this is one when vectors are identical and smaller numbers when they're different. So it's measuring a degree of likeness, not a degree of distance. Um, again, this formula for it looks hairy, but it's built up from smaller pieces. All it is is that saying that the two vectors similarity is the dot product of each other against each other, but again, it's shifted by the mean. So we take the mean off each vector and dot them against each other, and then everything in the denominator is just renormalization. But it looks like it's the similarity of the x to itself times the similarity of the y to itself. So it's saying the Pearson correlation coefficient is just how similar are these x to y compared to how similar x is to itself and how similar y is to itself. This going back to the mathematical idea of defining things in terms of their properties is a little clearer to understand if we slow it down. From the above formula, we can see that the correlation coefficient has a large number of invariants. It's, for instance, invariant over swapping the roles of x and y because it's symmetric in the formula. It's also invariant to adding a constant to every cell, the same constant to every cell, because we subtract the mean off everywhere x is. Therefore, if we added 7 to every cell, the mean would get 7 larger, and then it would again take that off. So, And then the third invariant is it's also invariant to any positive multiple, because x appears with the same dimensionality one time in, in the numerator and one time in the denominator. Uh, the square root undoes that squaring of dotting against itself. Therefore, it, um, if you multiply it by 10, you get the same correlation because it gets divided out. And again, we say only for positive numbers because uh, the sign is in the numerator but not in the denominator due to the conventions of the square root and the squaring. Now, another way of saying everything we set up to now is if x was such that it was already mean 0 and x dot x was already 1, 
and same for y, y was already mean zero and y dot y was already one, then none of these transforms we're talking about would be needed and we just get correlation of x to y is x dot y, relating it back to a previous idea. So it's probably easier and a quicker formula to not use this large formula to compute dot products, but in fact just to you know shift and rescale x and y to this standard mean zero unit norm form before computing the correlation. So notice how each idea is a small extension of earlier ones. It might have a large formula, but there's a small number of new ideas. We'll try to make this more concrete by working concrete examples, both using geometric objects and then also running code in R or Python. The point is that any time in data science, when you see a hairy formula, that's not for you to implement. That's for some package to supply to you. So it's not, it, yes, it hurts somebody, but hopefully it won't be you. Now, Again, I think that repetition is what people call understanding, or familiarity built through repetition is what people call understanding. So I'm going to repeat concepts in different contexts to give you a chance to make them physical, and then you might want to reread this whole, replay this whole thing, because certain concepts that may have been abstract early on may have more concrete founding for you later if you were to review this material. So let's move on to a demonstration. So let's build up some physical intuition of vectors by using physical measurements of physical objects. Here is a light box that is maybe about 4 inches by 4 inches. Here's a heavier box that is approximately 4 inches by 2.5 inches. The yellow bars are 4 inch measurements, and here we're denoting the width and the height of the lighter box by two yellow bars. We're denoting the width of the heavier box by a yellow bar, and then a white bar to denote the lesser height. Now again, vectors can store any numbers, doesn't have to be just heights and dimensions. So here we're going to estimate the weight. We say this is a 2.5 ounce box and the larger box, the smaller box is a 4 ounce box. And again, we're going to use the yellow to represent 4 and the white to represent 2.5. So it's the same number though in different units. Now we're going to encode this as a vector. We use that cap to denote the origin, these connectors to connect up the units. This is like a number line as we learned in grade school. And we can tell which segments which because they have a first, second, third relation from that cap origin. We can do the same for the other box. And what's going to be different is who's first, second, and third. So these are the vector representations of two of the spatial dimensions of each box plus the weight. Now notice we've lost the units and we just have these representations. We can make this a more random access structure where we can pick out one measurement without having to step through all the others by recording each measurement in a different dimension. Here we introduced the second measurement is at a right angle to the first and the third measurement is at a simultaneous right angle to the first two. So that's a new representation of that large light box. And the idea is we can measure off any one of those dimensions without the others just by calipering that thing in the appropriate dimension. Its uh, width is its width, its height is its height, and the weight is that third dimension. Here we're re-encoding the other smaller, heavier box. And again, notice that we're careful to preserve the order of the segments and use the same dimensions for each of these two representations. So these are three-dimensional vectors, where again, each displacement is in one coordinate after another. We're emphasizing that each vector has a different height and a different displacement into this third forward dimension. Now we're using a bit of string to denote the net displacement of the vector. Obviously each vector is a sum of each of its displacements in each coordinate, but really it also is a net displacement in space. Now we're seeing three dimensions, but 100 dimensional vectors might have a net displacement in the abstract 100 dimensional space, which obviously you and I can't visualize, though we will visualize it later with a scatter plot. What we're going to show is most of the information of the vector is the length and the angle from its origin. And so when it comes to comparing vectors, we think mostly about magnitudes and angles. And in the correlation, we're abstracting out the magnitudes to get down to the angles. So let's go back to our data on the boxes. So we can record a bunch of facts about box one, the larger, lighter box. For instance, we measured the width as four inches. We measured height 
which again was just the back depth of the box, as again four inches, and we estimated the weight as two ounces. Sorry, 2.5 ounces. Now for box two, we can record its measurements. And again, in this case, it was a width of four inches, a height of 2.5 inches, and an estimated weight of four ounces. We can lay this data out into an organized structure called a data matrix, where each row is an instance we're very much interested in, and every column is a possible measurement. So it's like a database schema. All rows have the exact same set of possible columns, and each column is in the same units for every row, though columns can have different information in different units from each other. This data structure prevents us, presents us with a number of vectors. For instance, any one measurement type is a vector, which we could call a column vector because it's oriented as a column. Though we can leave out the row or column orientation of a vector as an unimportant detail as we just did as we extracted out heights as a column, as a vector. We can also extract a row as a vector as we do here. What we're going to do is next show in a worksheet how we can use these datums and calculate over them, even though the data may come in from a spreadsheet, we, it is vectors in our mind. Now, for our final demonstration, let's demonstrate some Python code realizing the concepts we've been discussing. So here we have an instance of JupyterLab, and I've got a worksheet ready to go. First, I import all the packages we're going to need. Then, I read our data from a CSV formatted file. We can take a look at our data, and we see it's got two rows, pre-labeled 0 and 1 by the reader, and each one has the instance name and the three facts about the instance, the width, the height, and the weight. We can see the types of those columns, or the types of that variable, the types of those columns, and the column names. Notice that there is space inside the column names because the file had spaces around the commas. So we're going to fix the column names. Again, in this case, this square bracket is a list comprehension. It's sort of a fancy way of doing a for loop. And now we're going to take the instance name out of the set of columns and make it an index. We can also use the name of a column to extract the column. For instance, the um, taking out the width column gives us the two widths. Though notice this is not quite a vector. It's actually still a pandas type structure because we can still see the index names in there. I'm going to do a little more surgery on the data. I'm finding out all the value columns, so it's all the columns that weren't instance. And then also I will limit box down to just those columns. So now the instance name is the row name, but is no longer a data carrying column. As we can also see when we reinspect columns. And again, the width command still works as before. We can convert that from this pandas type structure to a numpy array by just calling numpy.array. And this is a more vector like representation. Notice we no longer have the names of the entries. We can also, as before, grab a row. We can grab the second row, because again, remember, rows are labeled numbered by 0 and 1. Or we can grab rows by name. And each one represents the three measurements for that box. And finally, we can get to what we always said vectors are for, things we can pull entries out of. So here now we're pulling out different entries, the first and second entry from this box 1 vector. We can also do our vectorized operation, compute the difference from box 2 to box 1 of each entry. Remember, they both agreed on a 4-inch width, but they differed in their height and uh, weight. We can also 
do a renormalizing, we could divide by two. And again, notice it happened to all entries. It's uh, This was four, four, 2.5 before, and now it's two, two, 1.25. We can compute the mean as promised. So we're now working through every concept from the original slide deck. We can define a function that computes the mean square difference. Box one is very much like itself. And box one and box two have a mean square difference of 1.5 in each entry. We can write a utility code that scales the data to be unit magnitude in the Euclidean norm. And we can then compute the dot product. So now that these two vectors are scaled, the dot product gives the cosine of the angle between them. So if they were parallel, we'd get a one, and if they were orthogonal, we'd get a zero, and if they're pointing anti-directions, we'd get a negative one a very useful summary of how related those two vectors are. Now we can do more normalization. We'll uh, both shift to have zero mean by subtracting the mean off every entry, and we'll again renormalize. And now we get a vectors that are both mean zero and are one when dotted against their self. Do that also to the second box's information. Just take a look at it. And um, we can then compute the dot product of those two boxes. You see now it's negative five, and that came largely from the shift to mean zero. And you can sort of see why that happens, that the first box, um, it says the second coordinate is half, almost a half up, and the next one is 0.8 down, whereas the other one reverses that. That shift back makes where they disagree have opposite signs. So both of these box descriptions disagree on sign in um, two out of the three positions. And so that means the dot product was multiplied like things has two rather large magnitude minus sign contributions and only one moderate positive sign contribution. So the dot product's going to be negative. And this brings up that we returns to the fact that I said that if you have normalized vectors that are mean zero, then the dot product is the correlation. So the dot product of these standardized vectors is the Pearson correlation of the original vectors, this negative 0.5. The 0.66 also returned turns out to be the p-value or significance of that minus 0.5. And again, large p-values, large being not much smaller than one are horrible. And this is horrible. It's saying you don't have enough coordinates to say whether box one and box two are related. That if there's only a few measurements being wrong, a few places is likely. It's with, with hundreds of measurements, we'd compute a correlation. And again, if you don't know what a correlation is, the help system it will help you. And there's tons of online documentation and discussions of that. Now, we said we would also show how to show two vectors or two boxes are related by another graphical representation called the scatter plot. So to get the scatter plot ready to go, we transpose the data. So what used to be a row is a column, what used to be a column is a row. And so you see box one is in one column, box two is in another column, and now the rows represent measurements. That lets us build the following scatter plot which is a little non-standard in that the, um, the points are labeled by color and shape as to which measurement they are. For instance, at this 4.0, we can see that both box one and box two agreed that width was four. Whereas here, for height, we say box one says the height was four, but box two said the height was 2.5. Though the scatter plot we more often see for especially for data sets that have hundreds of measurements per individual, usually do not have the points labeled. So here we have every fact about box one plotted up against every fact about box two. If the boxes were in agreement, it would be the line y equals x, or the dots would be trapped along that line. But you see, we know they disagree on this feature, but we don't know what that feature is, though in the previous plot, we would know that feature was height. And then we could also, um, through stronger annotation, put the words in addition to the colors right where they are. That this feature's height, this feature's weight. So box two had a four ounce weight, box one had a 2.5 ounce weight. Though what we want to emphasize is you almost always see this less informative unlabeled scatter plot for data, because what would be labeled here is which individual each point is, and that usually would be considered data messy. But the takeaway is the we often measure the correlation or the correspondence of two different measures of something by correlation and we often plot it as a scatter plot.
And that's kind of another use of vectors, that we use vectors to represent different features about individuals, or we can use vectors to represent different individuals sorted by feature. And that's what having the original data set or the transpose gave us. So there's a lot of different tasks we can use vectors for, and they're really the core of data science. And that concludes uh, my lecture on uh, vectors in data science. Uh, I hope what you take away is that they're largely a data carrying data structure, that we don't quite use them in the same sense mathematicians do until we want to compute similarity. And when we compute similarity, we bring in all those mathematical concepts we had earlier in this lecture to do that. And um, also, I hope you now appreciate that scatter plots, which you might see everywhere, are actually graphical representations of how similar two column vectors in a data matrix are. And now usually two columns in a data matrix are um, this diff two different measurements across all individuals. So usually in scatter plots, each dot is an individual and the coordinates are the two measurements. Um, however, as you saw when we transposed the data matrix, we can use that plot to do other things like show for two individuals how many different measurements they agree on. And again, the usual measurement of that is a correlation and under certain circumstances and most definitely for the dot product, the whole point is to reduce these complicated notions of similarity to something simple like the cosine of an angle treat vectors as directions and just treat that simple planar angle, not even anything very complicated, just the angle in the plane subtended by the two vectors, treat that angle as the um, measure of similarity or the cosine of that angle again. So small angles have a large similarity. And then um, all materials for this lecture are shared here on the GitHub, including the CSV or comma separated values file that the data was stored in and then the worksheets that ran all the code to do this. Well, thank you very much for your time, and I hope you enjoyed this lecture.